finally. <laughs> oh, gosh. If anybody's had challenges, I've had my fair share over the past several years of my life, and Facebook is challenging me. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Laura Joseph, owner of the Animal Behavior Center. We're an international educational center where we empower animals all over the world and the people that care for them. And then we do that through our live streaming services, um, which you can find out more about um, on our website at theanimalbehaviorcenter.com. Um, where do I even begin? <laughs> Um, I have been having a lot of challenges with Facebook lately. Ever since I got back from Las Vegas, my account was stopped, said that I needed to be verified. And then last week I went to go live, Coffee with the Critters, and it says, you have been blocked. And I was like, well, good. That's one less thing in my life I have to worry about right now. <laughs> and then today I try to go live and um, it won't let me connect to the Animal Behavior Center's Facebook page. So my computer is very lucky to be alive, even though it's not my computer's fault, but it's sitting right in front of me, displaced aggression. My Speaking of birds, my computer almost learned to fly today. <laughs> I'm sitting here thinking, you have got to be kidding me. You've got to be kidding me. I'm done. And then all of a sudden I rebooted and we were able to go live. So. There you go. Um, good morning, everybody. <laughs> um, for those that may not know uh, what we do, um, uh, we are a, 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 an edu international educational center where we focus on teaching people um, how to understand animal behavior, and we do that through the science of behavior called applied behavior analysis which focuses on B.F. Skinner's Laws of Behavior. Um, and I put all the science into very understandable everyday terms um, and examples. And we do that through a lot of our services. Um, our, we have online services, memberships, annual memberships, level one for companion animals, uh, where we have podcasts, monthly Q and A's, uh, live streams, um, guest speakers, well, once in a while in level one, but level two is more for people wanting to get into the field um, and um, where we have interviews with professionals, podcasts, monthly Q&As, uh, live stream group discussions, and more. Uh, we also have projects which are extremely popular, uh, the Parrot Project, the Pig Project, um, snow project, the deaf dog project, where people are interested in a particular species. You can find all of that on our website. So let's move on because I think I've got several weeks to catch up on for Pete's sake. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm seeing a lot of familiar faces. Maggie, Jill, Kimberly, Georgia, Shelly, Lisa, Tim Sparks, Emma, Shannon. Hey, Shannon. Um, I'll see you here in a few minutes. Um, Therese, Daniela, boy, we got a lot of people on here. Sue, uh, Carrie, Debbie. Um, good morning, everybody. Where do I even start? Holy cow, what a whirlwind of a year. Good morning, Katie. Um, yeah, so a lot of what I do or how I do this weekly live stream, supposedly weekly live stream, is I start off with what has happened here in the past week. There's a lot more than that has happened here in the past week than what I'm going to show, um, but a lot of it is relevant to today's topic. Uh, but before we get started, um, for those that want to, because we do have a zoo workshop coming up, and I'm scheduling even more workshops beyond beyond that. So you can find that those on our um, events page here on our Facebook page. Um, you can also find that on our website under events. And if you don't want to miss a thing, make sure you join our email newsletter list because there I will give an announcement of all upcoming events. Um, kind of waiting to see what happens here within the next month in this world. Uh, but I am doing, I'm already planning a lot of traveling. I've already been asked to speak two different places this year where I will fly to. 
Um, and that's just getting the year started. So speaking of getting started, um, oh, okay. Yeah. So, oh, look at that. I got bit by Andy yesterday. Yeah. See, I get bit too. Um, Andy is our major Mitchell's cockatoo that we stuck with um, Suki and we built a catch cage here with them. And we knew once we put them together, they were going to be hands off. And that's fine. That's fine. I want them to be together. I want them to be happy. Um, I don't care if I ever touch them both again in their lives as long as they are together and they're happy. And that's fine. And I got my finger a little too close <laughs> to the feed door yesterday. And Andy let me know that. So, um, come back to Norfolk. Did I say that right? Because it's not how <laughs> I'm supposed to say it. I kind of get um, confused. Anybody, anyway. Um, yeah, I plan on this year being full of travel. And uh, that's why I'm doing some things in my life that I'm doing right now to get to get this place ready for some workshops. Shannon's pulling up and walking in the door right now. Um, and th most of you know that we have recently moved. We are now the Animal Behavior Center at Indian Creek Zoo here in Lambertville, Michigan. And this whole year, there's a lot more to come that I'm not talking about. So get prepared. And it is for the betterment, the better lives of the animal, my animals, the animals in my care, the volunteers here, which is a lot of changes. Um, and me. Yeah. Finally, I'm going to put um, me and my happiness back on the line. So a couple of things. Um, we are still trying to get settled in here. There's a lot of things that happened where we moved in here, what, a month and a half ago? Oh, wow, well, almost two months ago. Um, thanks, Katie. Um, almost two months ago, and a lot of things have happened since then. We're still trying to get settled in, um, and it's it's really nice being out here at Indian Creek Zoo because we've got a side door. We walk out our side, boom, we're right into the side property of the zoo. And um, we are integrating with each other and functioning very well. And it's exciting. We've got a brand new future ahead of us. We, we will continue to do the work that we do and more. Um, I do want to say pay attention to our workshop schedule because I am going to start planning all workshops for this year and into next year. Um, so all the birds here are settling in nicely and, um, our volunteers are settling in nicely. What's really cool is a lot of our volunteers here at the animal behavior center. If you come out to Indian Creek zoo and take a walk around, you're going to recognize a lot of faces here from the animal behavior center. If that is not an emergency. Thought I was gonna have to end the live stream for a second. Um so anyways. Um, you're going to see a lot of familiar faces. You're going to see a lot of familiar, you're going to, zoo faces are going to start, zookeeper faces and people that work here at the zoo are going to start being more familiar here at the Animal Behavior Center because they're starting to integrate into the Animal Behavior Center and the Animal Behavior Center is starting to integrate into Indian Creek Zoo. So you'll see um, a lot of volunteers here at the Animal Behavior Center are starting to take job positions at Indian Creek Zoo while they continue to volunteer here. And we're just going like this and making things work. Um, and this is the lovely face of Lauren. She's been an intern from the University of Finley um, in animal science. She's volunteered for us for the past year. She's starting to get to know birds and understand birds. Um, she's recently just taken a position at 
Indian Creek Zoo in Commissary. So um, Lauren has an education in large animals and she does have a history on in understanding nutrition. So what whew, is happening, um, Dr. Jason Crean will be here in another couple of weeks and he um, works here. Um, at the Animal Behavior Center and at Indian Creek Zoo, um, focusing on uh, conservation, education, and nutrition. Um, so this is just one of several different ways in which we're integrating. Um, let me see, I'm gonna skip around a couple different, I'm not gonna show these in the order I thought I was going to, but um, what's really cool is this is Jill Growenhout. She is the, um, I've just taken her under my wing. She is the primary caretaker of zookeeper for birds. Um, so this is a position um, she knows. I told her if you work with me, I am very serious about any of the animals in my immediate care. Um, I am responsible here at Indian Creek Zoo for birds, primates, cats, and reptiles. <laughs> in addition to animal behavior, training, and enrichment. In addition to some other things, but that's okay. Um, that's okay. I'm extremely busy all the time and I'm interrupted quite a bit to um, be taken different directions, but I can, but I do it. I love it. I love a challenge. But anyways, Jill um, was for, formerly on small mammals here at Indian Creek Zoo. She now is our primary bird zookeeper. So um, I'm taking her under my wing and shaping her comfort level um, in working with birds. And I don't know if you've been watching our Facebook post over this past week, but um, I made a comment about animals we're afraid of, what that means, what that looks like, and why we have that fear and how to... I don't want to say get over that fear, but how to lessen that fear more through understanding the animal. Um, we're often afraid of things we don't know or we don't understand. So I'm trying to teach Jill how to understand not just parrots, but birds. Um, so I'm shaping her comfort level. So I start with one of the world's biggest parrots. <laughs> Bam! <laughs> Off with a bang. So I don't tell her what their beak pressure is per square inch because I just say, just make sure you don't put them in a place where they have to use it, especially for a sense uh, of defending themselves. So then I'm just like, just, I told her, and we'll kind of get in, I guess we're getting into Little Parrots 101. I told her, just stand in front of the animal, in front of the bird and just feed feed, feed, watch how they take, and this should be with any animal, watch how they take the food from your hand or from however you're delivering it. Um, and I told her there's a, parrots have a bone in their tongue. Um, so they will use their top beak and their tongue kind of like this, kind of like how we use our forefinger and our thumb to pick things up. So a lot of times people will get nervous when they see birds coming at you with your, their mouth open. And I would say, in the companion parrot community, 85% of the time, yeah, be afraid of that. But the other 15% of the time, um, that usually just means the bird wants to pick something up. So they're picking it up like this. Um, hey, Esmeralda, she's from Esmeralda, and her family are from Norway. They just joined the Parrot Project the other day, and Samantha says, taking the bird caretaker under your wing. Sorry, pun intended. Well, it wasn't, but it is now. Um, so Jill was not comfortable with the bird, and I will do this not no matter what the species um, of parrot, whether it's a parrot, whether it's a different bird, whether it's a, I don't care what it is. I am going to sit there. First, I'm just going to observe. Second, I'm going to start feeding. And it all I'm eating is behavior. Giving food is behavior. When one is giving food to another, that's the behavior of two coming together. Um, so anyways, 
if people are afraid of or nervous of feeding a parrot, I will say do it through um, a bird's enclosure so you can protect yourself through the enclosure bars and you make that you hi Shannon. You make that I don't know if she can hear me. Um, you make the bird reach as far as it can through the cage bars and what it's doing, it starts going like this and it's going to grab the food with its top beak, the hook bill and its tongue and it's gonna take it like that and just feed, 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 feed. And what you're doing is you are pairing yourself, presenting yourself as a conditioned reinforcer. Um, meaning you're pairing yourself with the animal's food. Be careful how you do that. <laughs> um, depending on whether you're an alligator, working with an alligator or a parrot. But you're pairing yourself with the animal's primary reinforcer, the delivery of the primary reinforcer. So now you start becoming a cue to the animal that whatever is getting ready um, to happen, you're pairing yourself with the positive. So then the animal starts looking forward to you approaching the enclosure. And don't forget, when working with a bird, a parrot, or an animal inside of an enclosure, I, I am very cautious um, approaching, especially a prey, not necessarily, any animal inside of an enclosure because their choices are limited. You may know what your intention is approaching the enclosure, but the animal inside it may not. And its choices are limited. And if it's trying to escape and you can't understand the behavior in which you're looking at, you may get lunged at, uh, bitten, what have you. And um, we need to take responsibility for that. Yeah, we do. It's time to buck up buttercups and take responsibility for our actions. And if you're going to start working with particular animals, it is your responsibility to educate yourself. Like that. You want to live with the world's largest flighted parrot? Be prepared for the noise. Be prepared for be prepared for the um, the exercise. I believe if if birds are flighted, leave them flighted. There are some instances. Um, I don't want to say I'm against clipping. Because I'm not. Because there's instances where I was like, this bird will be a lot happier in a home or educational center being taken outside. If with a harness, you can still do that. Um, even a clipped bird can fly. Um, but I am really big into least obtrusive. Um, I love working with birds that are flighted. Um, Speaking of that, they're coming up on that photo. Um, I need them to have that way to expend energy because if you take that away from them, this is just what I'm saying in um, my situations. Um, if we take the opportunity to exercise away from them in a particular way, you better figure out a way to let them expend that energy in another form. Otherwise, you're going to see that energy still come out, but it's going to come out through behavior issues. Okay, so then I started working with Jill. Um, she's just like, oh, I'm nervous of that beak. Don't be nervous of that beak. Um, don't put yourself in a position where you are nervous. We were just talking about this somewhere the other day. Um, I never put myself or rarely ever put myself in a situation working with any animal where I'm nervous. Because if I am nervous, that means I do not understand this animal. I do not understand their behavior. I don't know what's getting ready to happen. And then you can um, easily label the animal as unpredictable. And that is a label. And uh, be careful with your labels because it takes the responsibility off of us. When we say the animal's unpredictable, uh, maybe it's because we're approaching 
numerous people are approaching and we're extremely unpredictable because our behaviors don't match. The consequences aren't the same. Um, so it causes a lot of animals, especially ones in, in enclosures, to be put in positions to have to protect themselves. So then once Jill was comfortable with feeding the bird, I said, now ask it to step up. I know this bird. She does not. Okay. I'm setting her up for success. I am not going to have her do this with Rico because <laughs> Rico would nail her. Um, Rico is extremely bonded to me. So I am, I am setting her up for success with the best candidates to shape her comfort level with parrots. So I asked her to go ahead and ask him to step up. And I showed her before she did it. I'm like, I always put my hand either like this, like this, like this, like this, like this, um, right here, hold my fist up like this. I will hold a bird, however, um, based on the size of that bird's foot. So if I'm holding a large cockatoo, such as a Moluccan, I do put my fist like this so they can put their uh, feet around it like this. If I am picking up jelly bean, our curl crusted arasari, um, I will hold her like this or like this, I can't remember. I think it's one finger. Um, she perches and I feel, I feel their weight, how they distribute their weight and I will continue to adjust my hand based on their comfort level. I know when we were calling cello to us, and we do this with the kookaburras too. We call them to us like this. So if you go in and go like this, they're going to have no idea what you're asking. Because this means come for a hyacinth. This means come for an arasari. This means come for a roller pigeon. This means come for a Eurasian eagle owl. Um, it's all individualized. All right, so when I asked her to pick up this bird, here's some things to pay attention to. And I, I, I presented part of this at PPG out at Best Friends in Kanab, Utah, three, four years ago, um, Pet Professional Guild. It's primarily dog trainers. So a lot of these dog trainers signed up for a parrot class that I was giving. And it was a huge eye opener for them because I had them standing up, come over, pick these birds up. And they're like, I don't know how to pick a bird up. And I'm like, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you. Now here is like behavior 101 in parrots and understanding behavior. And I said, when you pick a bird up, listen to what I said, pick a bird up. You don't pick a bird down. Um, pick the bird up. So let's, sit, let's just say here's the perch going across right here. I will walk up to the bird, ask him to step up. One, wait for the second foot, okay? Because if you start pulling the bird away, it could knock that bird off balance. Um, so your target training, one, two, I want both feet here. Now pick the bird up. Don't pick the bird towards you like this because what happens is here's the perch, Here's the bird, okay, and its tail feathers are hanging down right here. So you pick it up, move it around like this, clear the tail feathers. Otherwise, you're picking it up like this, pulling it straight towards you. And what is happening is this branch that you're pulling towards you hits the tail feathers, knocks the bird forward, and you are pairing yourself with an aversive. Birds... I don't know any bird that likes to be knocked off balance intentionally, not knowing it's coming, even knowing it's coming. What you're doing is pairing yourself with knocking the bird off balance. And when I gave this presentation at PPG for the professional dog trainers, they were just like, whoa, I would never even have thought of that. Yes, think of that. And another thing was um, we were out there in um, an enclosed gazebo, but the wind was blowing. OK, these are always the individual animal is always the one that determines the positive reinforcers and the aversives. Aversives are something the animal does not like. So we were out there and the wind was blowing um, and 
I had stated, um, watch the direction to which the wind is blowing because in even watch wild birds in the wild, watch any, any animal in the wild. Um, but particularly birds, when the wind is blowing, say the wind is blowing from behind me towards me and it's blowing my feathers forward like this. If I'm a bird, it's blowing my feathers up like this and it's knocking me off balance. So you will see birds turn around and face the wind. So if I am flying in, flying a bird in a windy area, I am going, say the wind is coming this way. I'm going to hold this bird facing this way. I'm not going to turn that bird around against the wind because the feathers are going to ruffle their feathers. The wind is going to ruffle their feathers, blow um, them forward and knock them off balance. Uh, parrots are very, very light. Um, so those are things that I had mentioned out there that these are aversives that you're pairing unknowingly pairing yourself with. Okay. The animal, the bird, the animal is always the one that determines the, uh, aversive. That's why I say I, before I start interacting with an animal, I watch them. Okay. So then, um, this is bell and jewel, um, Indian Creek zoos, hyacinth macaws. Um, and we've worked with them since they were, I can't remember this may, we will have had them at the zoo for a year. Um, and they were hatched a couple months prior. I don't know how many months, five months. I don't know how many months I can't remember. Um, so I wouldn't win working with both of these since they came here and you can see I was working with them yesterday. I've been extremely busy the past two months. So a lot of training has come to a complete halt. Um, we're starting that back up again. So what has happened over the past couple of months is Bell and Jules nails have not been filed. We've been just in the beginning stages <laughs> for several months of training them. Um, but I haven't had time and now their nails are so sharp. It's hard for me to pick them up. And the sharpness of their nails will positively punish the behavior of me picking them up. This is why we like to, like to keep all of our animals, all of our birds groomed, um, nails filed. So when I have to pick them up now, I'm picking them up like this so it doesn't scratch me. But anyways, next step, what I did with Jill is I brought out these two perches you will see sitting there side by side. We had those over at the zoo. We brought them over to the, to the center. And these flying back and forth from perch, from perch to perch is a behavior these two know very well. So I'm setting Jill up. Hang on. Was that for me? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Um, so I set them up for success, flying them from perch to perch, um, and then flying them from person to person. So now you have to adjust reinforcement. Okay. And identify reinforcement because jewel will fly to me just for the opportunity to be with me. Blue will fly to me just for the opportunity to be with jewel. So I know um, I know I can get blue to follow me because he'll go wherever Jewel is. Um, Jewel is very attached to me and, um, she prefers to stay on my shoulder versus flying off. We're trying to, I, I'm, and I just talked to somebody about this the other day. This goes for parrots. This goes for social creatures. Um, it is so common, especially in the companion parrot world, for a bird to be very bonded to one person in the household. There is an extreme problem with that. And a lot of people think it's funny in the beginning until it's not. 
anymore. And then it's not funny anymore when it's a problem and everybody else in the household is getting upset. The screaming starts going off the handle because the preferred person has left and the birds start screaming um, so much because it's attached to this person. But this is a behavior that was trained. Okay, if that animal can see, smell, hear, or feel you, you are training that animal whether you realize it or not. And I will tell you, I love working with multiple species of animals. I don't work with just parrots. I love working with alligators. I love working with primates. Um, I love working with aquatics. I love working with anything anything if it's moving and it's thinking i love working with it but i'm going to tell you working in the zoo community one animal that is highly overlooked um that is extremely intelligent and that most people don't understand i'm here to tell you that is the parrot okay um, they're extremely intelligent. And a lot of times when you're thinking zoo animals, you're thinking intelligence, it's the primates. Take a look at the parrots because I work with all of them and parrots are overlooked. And the reason I love working with parrots is because of how fast they think, um, how they can solve problems by not necessarily interacting with something but watching how you do it and then engaging in it. Yeah. When people come to me or see some of my work with parrots, it's kind of a double edged sword because I'm informing people about parrots and their creativity and their intelligence level and watch what they can do. But these are parrots I've been working with. Watch what they can do. And then people that don't know parrots are like, Oh, I think I want one. And then you're like, Oh, crap. <laughs> and I don't ever say, no, don't do that. I say, oh, you think you do? Okay. Because I'm going to tell you, I would live my life no different than being surrounded by animals, particularly parrots. I love parrots. They complicate the living hell out of my life. If I wanted something easy, I should have picked something else because the parrot, it is not. <laughs> um, so I always say the more intelligent the animal, the harder it is to live with. That is the parrot. So there are many things you need to think about, okay? Um, so I'll tell you what attracted me to parrots was my love for paleontology. Um, dinosaurs, birds are dinosaurs. And if you think I'm crazy, do your research. Uh, any paleontologist will tell you the same. Um, so I found the similarity. I found out how unique they were. I was studying their skeletal system, uh, the respiratory system. And I was like, holy shit, this is amazing. Um, and that's what attracted, attracted me and feel free to, start jumping in here because I've had people visit here that are dog people and they're like, oh, I think I want a cockatoo. And I'm like, oh, I think you need to stick around a little longer. Okay. Um, some of the things that attract us to parrots are their color, their unique form of locomotion, which can be flight that can either attract you or scare the hell out of you and make you run, <laughs> which does a lot of people, which I think is funny. Um, because we're afraid of what we don't know. And when something flies, it will scare people um, because it's a unique form of locomotion, not just to the bird. Um, they, they, they can talk. Um, I don't, I don't want to say I haven't taught any mind to talk because I have, I've taught, we're all teaching Rocky how to roar like a dinosaur and say octopus and say all kinds of things. Um, if you're thinking about getting a parrot, if you think you want a parrot, I'm going to tell you, and you are not going to listen to me. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, and you are not going to listen to me. And then you're going to be my client in six months. Don't be my client. Okay. I'm going to tell you 
do your research. I can't tell you how many times people have contacted me saying, I want to buy a gift for my daughter or I want to get a parrot for the house. And I'll be like, okay, thanks for contacting me. Um, and they're reaching out to me to get more education on it. And it's like, great. I will positively reinforce the hell out of that behavior. Um, and I'm not going to try to deter now. I might, um, I'm not going to deter them from their, from getting a parrot or their interest in a parrot. Because a lot of times when you tell people you don't want to do that, you know what happens? They get very defensive and hang up the phone on you and they listen no more behind that. No. Okay. So I pull them in and I tell them how fascinating they are and come on in, come on in and let me investigate your mind and help you. So, um, then I start at, usually they'll start saying, I want a big pink one or the, I hope my girlfriend Jeannie's listening. <laughs> Samantha says, tell me no, tell me no. Um, that's Rocky, our Moluccan cockatoo, who's in the Stanley Steamer commercials. Um, I don't know if my girlfriend Jeannie's listening. Jeannie, are you listening? When people come to me and they say, oh, I've already done all my research. I want an Amazon Gray. I'll say, oh, interesting. <laughs> Good. Let's find out where you got your research and let's start back from ground zero. <laughs> Um, or they say, I want the green one, or I have a history in parrots. I had a green one and I'm thinking of all the green parrots and I'm like, okay, which one? Neclectus? Um, no, the green one. Oh, Amazon? <laughs> no, the green one. Um, anyways, so I highly suggest, I'm going to sound like a broken record go volunteer at a shelter. Okay. I can't say that enough. Um, because you think you want a macaw. Mm -hmm. Go work in a room full of 50 macaws and you'll come home with a budgie. <laughs> um, you think you want that cuddly cockatoo. Go work in a room full of cockatoos that are bonded to one another. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get near that cage. Okay. And like I said before, um, you'll see animals or you'll see parrots specifically bonds to this one person in the household. Everybody else is down here. Okay. That is not, that is one of the biggest problems I hear. I biggest problems I get contacted about are screaming over bonded uh, they just don't know what it's called when the animal is attracted to just one person in the household and will attack everybody else. Biting, lunging, feather plucking. Uh, those are some of the top ones. But here's the thing I tell people. I said, this is very common when an animal is, when a parrot is attached to one person and everybody else in the household is down here. The hard part is not changing this. That's easy. That is easy. I've done it several times, but what will happen is it goes like this. Okay, so um, the hard part is not getting it to go like this. The hard part is getting it to go like this and then stay right there. That takes attention to detail. It's not, I don't want to say it's hard. If you, what's hard is people paying attention to detail. That's hard, okay? If you can get it here, you can keep it here. And once you keep it here, everybody's happy and everybody needs to be happy because if everybody's not happy, that bird is on its way out the door. It's taking the first steps of getting rehomed. Okay. And it is nothing the bird has done. The bird's behavior has been shaped 
that way, and it has been trained. Um, yeah, Lynn says, um, I only have five macaws. All of them are rescues. It is a lot of work. So um, birds aren't dirty. I know plenty of people out there going, what? They just make a lot of messes. Birds are pretty clean. They just make a lot of mess. They poop everywhere. Um, but you can control where they poop. Um, I let's see if I have this on my window behind me. I don't know if you can see this window perch. Mm -hmm. You can control where a bird poops by where you place their perches throughout the house. So this window perch is over my shoulder in on a window in my office, which Rico will fly from his pl PlayStation, fly through here and land on that perch. And if he lands there, he's not pooping on my head. He's pooping underneath. Um, birds usually like their tail cleared in order to poop. So they don't poop when they're sitting on a table. Most likely they're not going to poop when they're sitting on a table. You go over and pick that bird up and let that bird clear its tail. It's going to poop after it's been sitting for long periods of time. Um, birds, another way, I train a lot of different species of birds to tell if a bird is nervous is it will poop as you start approaching the cage because it's getting prepared to lighten its load and take off. Um, that's why I say, you know, a lot of birds, if I can tell if a bird is fearful, I don't know why an owl keeps coming to mind. As you approach the cage, they start going like this. They'll start looking to the side because they're looking at their escape route, okay? Uh, hornbills, you approach them, they poop. Um, that's how you can tell when you're nervous. Well, one of many ways. Um, but get to understand that bird. Take some online classes. Reach out to people. Join bird clubs. They do still exist, I believe. There's online bird clubs. I know um, I started a bird club here probably 12, 13 years ago. It's still out there, but it's just online until i decide if I want to pick it up and move it to the next level again. It's called the Parrot Society of Northwest Ohio. But um, it's why I started the Parrot Project. The Parrot Project is extremely popular. Um, it's a membership to an online group of, there's 210 of us, I don't know. It's an annual um, subscription to a group where I live stream my work with parents. I do monthly Q and A's. People post videos of their problems they're having with their parrot. And I jump on and say, boom, right there. This is where you do this. Um, it, we have online consultations in there. We have guest speakers. At, but the I'd say the most popular part of the Parrot Project is the online live streaming and the importance is not watching the live attending the live stream it's watching the replay and seeing all that training unedited and i will point out every mistake i make if i make a mistake and if people don't see it i will point it out again because sometimes they're so subtle because behavior can be so subtle and then i replay it and have you watch it again and show you how i recoup from it we can learn a lot about parrots through talking with other people that have parrots. Go to their house, sit down and have dinner. See if that's even a possibility. Um, a couple other things. Um, yeah, uh, just looking through what some of you guys are saying. Um, we got a couple people in here in the Parrot Project. Um, Kimberly Perry as well. And then Lindsay Robbins in is in as Lindy, blah, Lindsay Robin is in as well. She says, I volunteered at a bird store and only after working with macaws did I learn that I could add one to my life. And here's something, here's something else. I mean, I did a lot of looking before I got my first bird, but I didn't do a lot of research. So I know I'm you know, I'm just, I've made mistakes and I try to help people learn from what I, my first bird was an umbrella cockatoo. Holy man. <laughs> my life could have been a lot easier if I 
just got a plant or a fish, which I did both of those, but something was still a void in my life. So I got a cockatoo. Yeah. <laughs> Smart move. Now I have four cockatoos. Now I have four cockatoos in an Amazon. Um, I also, that are mine. I have two hyacinth macaws over here. I see you. Got Jules staring right at me. Um, those are the zoos. Um, and we have six other parrots here at the zoo. Uh, we have more than that. We got a huge eagle over my shoulder with, I'd say about a hundred birds in there. Um, yeah, I threw myself in the deep end, Katie. Um, go big or go home. So I will say I see a lot of newer bird caretakers and I see some other people do this too is it's so intriguing that you just go get another one. Just go get another one. Take your time because your future will be a living hell. If you do not take your time and do your research and get the birds that truly are a match from, for you. Um, then next thing you know, you're living in a house with 10 birds and you've got eclectuses in with macaws in with cockatoos in with cynicals in with budgies and with Amazons and nobody can interact. Um, and you can only, and these birds are in enclosures and you want to get them out, but this bird can't stand this bird. And then birds start staying in their cage longer periods of time because you can't get them out because they'll attack another bird. And then the longer, a lot of times, the longer a bird stays in its cage, the more it starts to become more territorial around its cage, which could lead to being cage bound, where you can't touch the cage. You can't get around the cage. I, it is very important for me because I've seen a difference of doing this and not doing this. This is why we have two PlayStations hanging out here. Um, in just the bird room of the center there we go. and we've got two more we're getting ready to hang and then we're going to hang like four more in the enrichment room birds need to be in my opinion and in my experience they need to be moving to different whether it's everybody just moves one cage to the left today tomorrow everybody moves one cage to the right it keeps that mixed up keeps their environment changing because the more it doesn't change, the more behavior issues start to creep up. And once they start creeping, boom, they just skyrocket. And you've heard me say the smarter the animal, the harder it is to keep. Then you've got your health concerns where you now you have to go to an avian vet, an exotic vet. And I highly recommend a avian board certified vet. If you, my concern about not going to an avian board certified vet or a vet that knows birds very well is because the anatomy is very different. You cannot uh, medically treat health, uh, health wise a bird the same way you do a dog. That's a concern. I used to work um, in an avian vet for several years. Um, and when you get into exotic medicine, exotic practice, avian veterinarians, it's a lot more expensive than a dog vet. Okay. Cause now you're paying for the specialty. And then also you guys, you have to give these guys enrichment. You have to a bird that does not interact with something in its enclosure, um, such as a toy, such as foraging, reach out to me. I will help you. You may, a lot of times people get stuck in thinking my bird doesn't play with toys. Your bird should be interacting and engaging with something. Okay. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I train because it's a way to get them engaged. And in the parrot project, one of the first things I do is get that animal foraging for its food because it's working for its food. Um, Find the right bird for you. Um, reach out to me. You can find me at theanimalbehaviorcenter.com. Um, I don't just, just deal with birds. I focus on the science of behavior with animals. 
and how to shake that behavior um, with people and get their comfort level. And um, I have several different areas in which I, my area, my area of specialty is using applied behavior analysis with animals. That is my area, my specialty. I just really love birds. So that's why we have the parrot project, which you can find on our website, the animal behavior center.com. Um, you can also email me, Laura, L A R A at the animal behavior center.com. Um, where is that photo? There we go. Let's get this one off of here. Um, but we have the parrot project. And if you're watching this, you're either extremely interested in applied behavior analysis, you're interested in applied behavior analysis and how it works across species, or you're interested in parrots. And if you're interested in parrots, I highly advise you look into the parrot project. Ask people on here. Ask, <laughs> ask the public out there on Facebook. Um, what do you know about the parrot project? Because the testimonials we get at the parrot project um, speak for themselves. So um, we also have other things such as our level one and two memberships. A lot of people that are in the prayer project join level one or level two, where we focus level one, we focus on companion animals in applied behavior analysis, including monthly Q and A's podcasts. People join. If you're joining just for the podcast, I'd say it's worth it. Um, ask everybody on here. I have no idea. Um, but Level one is $149 for the whole year. That includes monthly Q and A's, monthly podcasts. Level two is more for people interested in getting in the field. We also have workshops, zoo workshops. We have something else we're getting ready to come out that's going to be online. Our services have been online for seven years, at least seven years. We didn't go online because of the pandemic. We were already online. Um, we have webinars, whether that's understanding behavior, species specific. Here's one of our most popular. Um, our podcast, keep an eye out for those. Those are in level one, level two. We also live stream here on the Animal Behavior Center's Facebook page every Sunday morning um, at 9 a.m. Eastern. Um, thank you, Melinda. Um, we also have our referral program, which if for every um, five referrals that we get from you that sign up for one of our projects or the memberships, we give you a one hour, a one hour online um, consultation. We still, we also have online consultations and I get contacted about them all the time and people want to sign up for one. And I will say, sure, I'll do one because I'm getting ready to do one next week and we're booked out now. We're booked out for a couple of weeks, but um, I will tell them, join one of these memberships first, because here's what happens. I give a consultation to you. It's over in an hour, hour and a half. And I don't have you after that to guide you. That is why I created the Parrot Project. That's why I created the membership. So if you consult with me, now I have you for a whole year where I can interact with you every week, every day if I have to. Um, but I help you. I'm there to guide you every month. So with that, I want to say thank you. If you guys know of somebody wanting a parrot, wants to get a parrot, please share this live stream with them. Um, and I will see you guys next week. It's good to be back in the saddle again. Take care, everybody.